You're listening to the Carib Climate Podcast, produced by the Investment Plan for the Caribbean Regional Track of the Pilot Program for Climate Resilience, funded by the Inter-American Development Bank through the Climate Investment Funds and implemented by the Project Management Unit of the University of the West Indies Mona Office for Research and Innovation. Despite the fact that the Caribbean experiences two seasons, wet and dry, climate and weather conditions in the region have changed significantly. These changes affect climate-sensitive sectors such as tourism, agriculture, health and water. Understanding the influences of climate extremes such as hurricanes, floods and drought is necessary to make long-term predictions. In this episode of the Carib Climate Podcast, we feature the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology, CIMH, based in Barbados. We hear from Senior Lecturer and Hydrologist, Dr. Jonathan Cox, Agrometeorology Chief, Adrian Trotman, Climatologist, Cedric Van Meerbeek, and Technical Officer, Dodian Petrie, as they share how the CIMH through the Caribbean Regional PPCR, expanded regional climate monitoring networks to develop climate products and services to manage risks and reduce the impacts of climate change. How has climate change affected weather and climate patterns in the Caribbean? I would say what we've observed in recent times are more extreme events. So we would find that the rainfall would be extremely heavy in a short period of time, whereas in the past we don't have so many records of episodes of that type. Additionally, I think we are seeing extremities of temperature or heat episodes, which obviously provides energy for more severe storms which can have very serious implications for the Caribbean. How does the Caribbean contribute to the Global Climate Information Centre? Well, essentially, the Bavan Climate Information Centres are connected via a global network and uh, meteorological information, meteorological data, should I say, is sent to these these centres. Also, the work with what we call, you know, in the regional climate center, uh, uh, global uh, centers, global producing centers, uh, and uh, some data is shared there as well, uh, largely for us uh, to utilize the, the, the services of these global producing centers. In addition to uh, the global producing centers, There is also the link downwards to the national climate centers, whereby uh, the data exchange is also critical because it is through exchange of national climate data that regional climate centers, such as the CIMH, is able, together with the national meteorological and hydrological services of the Caribbean, in our case, to produce um, climate information products and services. So really and truly, the the exchange of data and information goes both from the global level to the regional level and back, and also from the regional to the national level and back. The National Meteorological and Hydrological Services operate as the national climate centers in the region. These centers through the PPCR have benefited from training and information development. The CIMH team gives more detail on how the PPCR has enhanced capacity across the national meteorological and hydrological services. Through the regional track of the PPCR, we have been able within the Caribbean region to have training organized for uh, six uh, Caribbean countries that are part of the regional track. So those are Jamaica, Dominica, St. Lucia, um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, uh, and Grenada, and Haiti. And for these countries, we have been able to work with the National Met Services 
or the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services officially to provide them with the training they need to, uh, to start or to uh, enhance the production and delivery of climate information products on an operational basis. And this has been done through a series of training workshops that were made possible through the PPCR uh, uh, project. And in these, in these training workshops, it was really to show uh, the, uh, the med services of those six countries what is possible given the resources in terms of uh, global guidance on how to best uh, produce climate information, but also the kind of tools that are available to produce such information and the data that is required to perform the analysis to produce such information and then focus on the tools and the data that we utilize in the Caribbean for uh, Caribbean relevant climate information, but then at the national scale. So the training workshops that have been uh, running uh, for uh, those six uh, Caribbean countries under the regional track have enabled the Met Services to know what is possible and has started to build their capacity to provide operational climate information where it had not started yet, where it had started yet, which was the case for most countries, it provided a little bit more of a holistic view of what kind of uh, climate information could be produced by uh, uh, the MET services. The development of climate products and services was an important output under the regional PPCR project. Meteorological officers use climate information to produce climate products and services, which help different sectors make critical decisions to avoid damaging impacts of climate change. What are some of the new or improved climate products and services that were developed under the PPCR initiative? The National Meteorological and Hydrological Services, through the, the training, uh, was able to develop bulletins. Uh, some of them had no, no climatic bulletins, no information products. Uh, by the end of, 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 of the period, uh, there would have been countries who now have uh, climate information products in the form of climate bulletins that they produce monthly and disseminate to their users. Uh, I mean, one of one of the, the the primary successes in this, I would say, would have been the working with the Grenada Met Service uh, in developing their bulletin from from the very beginning. Uh, another country to mention would be Saint Lucia, uh, and they would also have been included, including messages uh, to their sectors in in some of these cases. The intervention was also able to expand the quality of climate products and services, which resulted in more detailed bulletins that were specific to each sector. So prior to the invention of the PPCR, the Grenada Met Service, they actually had um, uh, an ad hoc in-house product that they were developing, and that was called the Dewis at the time. It was um, Dewis means Drought Early Warning Information Systems, and that was a report that they were producing um, ad hocly. At the first national consultation, it was recognized that this report could actually be transformed into a climate bulletin. And since then, um, we have had through the PPCR. Um, project a uh, number of feedback exercises that the team at CIMH um, participates in that is the social scientists um, along with um, the climatologists, uh, myself as a technical officer, Adrian as the um, as the head of the RCC. So it was the two climatologists um, as well as um, other members of the team that so the bulletins got a wide array of feedback from the team at CIMH and through these iterations of feedback exercises 
the bulletin was um, transformed from the Juris Report, which it was initially, to what is now the Grenada Climate Services um, Bulletin that is disseminated monthly. And it also went through an iteration where they were only um, producing climate um, messages to a point where they are now producing sector-specific um, climate implications. And these are for the agriculture, water, tourism, energy and health um, sectors in Grenada. How do enhanced climate products and services prepare the Caribbean for natural disasters? Climate products from um, climate information providers is for early warning and supports preparedness. In the climate information space, the early warning period is longer. Seasonal, as we, we normally say in, in, in our climate variability world, uh, three to six months in advance to sub-seasonal scale, which is one to four weeks. Uh, in a, uh, one to four weeks in, a, in advance for one week period. Each time scale helps to prepare in different ways. If we were to consider, for example, the weather con uh, time scale, we talk about imminence. We talk about, okay, let's get moving. Let's go. And in the case of the climate time scale, we were talking about seasonal. Uh, the, the warning and the preparedness is more along contingency planning. It's more or less along the lines of getting yourselves ready for what these forecasts might suggest. And, and, and part of the information uh, provided is also to look at the recent uh, past because what has happened recently tends to give us some idea uh, of how uh, the future, how the forecasted conditions might impact. Uh, and if I might give, might give an example of this, uh, a crop that has gone through a dry period recently uh, would respond differently to the amount of rainfall that is likely over the next uh, three months or even over the next few weeks. Uh, but one that has gone through a dry spell would respond by the end of that, that, that period in the future differently. It will look different uh, or it's likely to look different to one that has not been through uh, a dry period in the recent past. The way that climate products and services can help uh, the Caribbean for disasters that arise from natural hazards which sometimes are called natural disasters, um, is basically because, as, um, as we've heard previously, the, uh, the information provides either uh, an insight into how we can better uh, plan for contingencies if you get information at the seasonal timescale, or to get ready and deploy uh, for response to uh, for early response to um, the impending uh, disasters or for very last minute preparations at the sub seasonal time scale and then really uh, deploy at the the weather time scale really and truly this is the early warning information side of climate services so climate services can on the one hand help with early, with providing early warning information for uh, impending disasters or impending hazards that lead to disasters, to be more correct. On the other hand, it can also help at a very long time scale, and I'm talking about the climate change time scale of de several decades. It helps in long term adaptation, and so both functions are served by climate services. And even though operational products that the meteorological services of the region tend to focus on are more linked to early warning information services, there is also, uh, thanks to the climate data that is being collected, that is being analyzed, there is also uh, research being done on trends in uh, climate and climate extremes 
in the Caribbean, which of course it is those extremes that uh, could uh, uh, more readily lead to disasters than how average climate conditions evolve. So even on a long-term time scale, the, the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services of the Caribbean do um, uh, prepare and provide some information for long-term adaptation to reduce the risk of uh, disasters, to uh, um, basically widen or broaden, broaden our coping range to uh, uh, more extreme conditions in the future than have uh, happened in the past. Increasing the capacity for the backup storage of regional data was an important goal for the project. How important is the storage of climate data? So having an archive to fall back on is extremely, extremely important. Having that storage becomes critical. Backing up means that should something untoward take place at any one of the region's next services, there's an avenue through which these countries can retrieve their own data. So the multi or satellite data storage centers uh, would make sure that should a situation, for example, a hurricane or even an earthquake that disrupts access to, to, to storage, that one, if not two of the satellite sites will allow access to a country's back, backed up data. So this storage, uh, this storage in the three locations become extremely important for the security of our, our, our data in the region. Another critical outcome was to improve the acquisition of weather data. Well, there were essentially four subcomponents of component two. Uh, one of them was to uh, enhance and add to the observation network where we collect data. Uh, by retrofitting or uh, providing uh, new automatic stations. We would have raised already the issue related to backup storage, backup of our, our data from our, across the region. Uh, archives are very important, as I said, in making sure that should something untoward happen, then we have access uh, to the country's data otherwise. But these two will help to then support the other two parts of the, the, the component two, the other two subcomponents, uh, that is um, building the capacity of the national met services as national uh, climate services providers uh, to build products and services to support decision making uh, in their countries and uh, planning policy making as well. The other one, where we talk about uh, building uh, these products and providing the, um, the enabling environment to so do, uh, particularly linked with the global framework for climate services as led by the World Meteorological Organization, is to provide the necessary guidance, uh, the necessary uh, direction to how these countries working collaboratively between the National Met Services and the important socioeconomic sectors that are impacted by weather and climate, by supporting them, by providing essential direction uh, through establishing roadmaps and plans of actions for climate services, while at the same time looking at how climate services is governed in these countries. That becomes very important that um, the collaborative agencies, the agencies that collaborate on this, uh, together understand how it's governed, how it's meant to work, who does what, who provides certain bits of, uh, of support. So all these were discussed and is a part of the deliver delivery of component two. Over the course of the project, 41 weather stations were installed across Dominica, Grenada, and St. Lucia. The regional PPCR facilitated an upgrade of 40 existing weather stations to automatic monitoring stations in Jamaica. Training and capacity building was integral to help national meteorological offices deliver 
on their expanded roles as national climate centers. The six countries involved in the PPCR project were all trained in uh, developing climate products. So that would in include Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, Dominica, Jamaica, and Haiti. And there were about uh, 53 persons who were trained under this program. With the frequent changes in climate and variability, expanding regional climate centers in the Caribbean is a huge task. What have been some of the challenges in implementing this initiative? First of all is, one of, one of the challenges that we had, and that's why uh, the roadmap is no longer, is not at this time complete, but will be soon, uh, being able to find the relevant um, persons with background that could support us, for example, in the roadmap and plan of action. Uh, so that was a challenge. And in finding the best fit for that, uh, COVID didn't help uh, very much, but COVID is a different uh, point that I'll make later. The national Met services in the Caribbean are small, both with respect to human and financial resources. The individuals who work with us from the Met services and who have and those who have been trained uh, in product development, for example, uh, they have multiple responsibilities. Climate information and services is just one of them, uh, and uh, you find that the, their time is so much divided. Uh, into all these different tasks, including the one we are speaking to now, uh, that uh, it provides a challenge when it comes to uh, building their capacity, but also responding to the built capacity by supporting uh, climate information development. But the good thing is, is that we have some dedicated persons who are very interested in climate services and climate services, and they take their own time out to make sure that, the, that products and services in one form or the other are available, even if it means supporting with data. The human, in, the human resources concerns are not limited uh, to the med services. Having personnel within the sectors who can liaise, who can discuss climate with the national med services, that's also a limitation because many of them are, have not been trained to, to so do. And many of them more or less get their background uh, from sitting in these meetings, uh, that some of which, as I said, we have had under this program. So that's another concern. How do we build a cadre of persons in this sector who can work with the National Met Service, discuss things with the Met Service and understand and be able to apply and inter interpret and apply uh, the information received? I did mention COVID. Uh, I mean, there have been delays since COVID raises its head. Uh, whereas uh, meetings via the technology allows for continued engagement, there are some deliverables that are best delivered during face-to-face -face interaction. And uh, so COVID has presented some challenges as well and continue to do so as we, we may well imagine. Regional coordination often faced land and language barriers. One of the challenges that uh, came to the fore with respect to training the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services is the different locations uh, with uh, respect to access. Um, now, the, most of the no, all the trainings were actually conducted before COVID-19 ar arose. So it was not a problem of not being able to uh, travel due to uh, COVID restrictions. But in one particular case, in the case of Haiti, when we wanted, when we were ready uh, to um, conduct a training, uh, Haitians were not, not allowed to, um, to travel and it was very difficult to access to enter the country of Haiti because of civil unrest. Fortunately, uh, through very tremendous efforts, I should say, on behalf of uh, the DMED service in Haiti, they have been able to send out uh, their, uh, their trainees 
to Dominica to have a joint training session for the Dominican National uh, Meteorological and Hydrological Service and the one from Haiti. But then there's the language barrier that arises because, as you may know, well, both Dominica and um, Haiti have a form of Creole that is being spoken, but that Creole is not 100% uh, intelligible, mutually intelligible, and the trainers did not speak that language either. So we're left with either speaking English or speaking French. Now, a very technical challenge, and that was a small challenge, but still uh, it was a real challenge, is to deliver the training to the same level of quality in both English and also in French. We did not have, we didn't have uh, translators or interpreters. Fortunately, myself, I am a French speaker, so I could translate most of the essence in French, but you can imagine that if you deliver training in two languages, it, st it takes more time and you can't repeat 100% the same information in both languages. But we found a way uh, that was satisfactory to both uh, the Dominicans and the Haitians to complete uh, the, the conduction of that training session within the time frame that was allotted. And so it was really um, a good thing to see that we were able to circumvent the challenge by uh, at least providing the essence in both languages and then focus uh, questions and answers in the language that they were posed to us, trainers. Effective governance could pave the way for smoother project implementation. So one of the challenges that I would um, highlight is actually getting the governance mechanisms um, to, you know, really carry out the roadmap and plan of action in the PPCR countries. Um, that has been a challenge and it points back to the capacity um, challenge that Adrian mentioned earlier, and that is to get the different entities together to actually come up with the TORs for, um, for these uh, governance mechanisms. So while it was decided on that, yes, these are the, um, already established institutions or organizations that we will go forward with to govern climate services in the um, three countries, Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. While the, while the choice was made that these are the institutions that would lead um, the climate services um, interventions, the TORs have not been developed and that points back to the capacity and the time that is available within these um, within the various sectors and the Met Office to actually come up with and finalize the TORs for these governance mechanisms. So that is one of the challenges that I would um, like to highlight that has not already been highlighted. The strengthening of capacity, backup of storage, availability of new and improved climate services, and plans of action to support regional climate monitoring are the major highlights of the project's successes. There were a number of successes. Through the training, there are persons in each met service that know how to get the job done uh, relative to climate information provision and services and that these are often very dedicated persons, as I said. These are very ded dedicated persons. And because though, albeit small services, because we have a, a dedicated set of persons in the climate services arena, in these met services, the job typically gets done, however they f have to do it. Of course, when it comes to, to data uh, provision, so that uh, products could be created, having more uh, stations through, through uh, retrofitting and newly installed stations, we know that, they, that there is continued uh, support along these lines for products and services, albeit in the case of the new uh, stations, it takes a while to build uh, the, 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 the relative uh, number of years of time series to support 
particularly climate, but certainly it will support uh, weather-related uh, information. We feel confident as well that there's data stored at multiple locations in case there's something untoward happening in any particular location that Met Services have uh, another avenue uh, to get their data should that happen uh, uh, at those un unfortunate and uh, unwelcome circumstances. We also, in the near future, will have uh, information related to climate and water and health uh, and agriculture that uh, is being developed to attract policymakers, to get policymakers into the discussion as well, uh, mainly through uh, the regional products from the RCC here at CIMH. Uh, Engaging policymakers is very, very important. I think that's what we one of the, the benefits of, of, of uh, the information that we are providing in, in the brief to policymakers. So they become part of the conversation. And it's always important to not only include uh, the, the technocrats, but those who have the decisions to make. And uh, we would also want to mention again, uh, the roadmap and plan of action that provides the guidance and directions uh, to the Met services and the sector agencies being able to, to be able to build the information that decisions uh, can be can be made. I uh, would want to to end here by saying that at the end of the day, the, the PPCR regional track. Was able, was able to get meteorologists and other uh, sector practitioners in the region to sit down together and talk about climate and how the information from climate can be used to support planning, decision-making and policy-making. And that is very important. A true marker of a successful initiative is one that goes beyond boundaries. One additional feature that was a success out of the regional track for the PPCR uh, from uh, the perspective of the uh, National Meteorological and Hydrological Services is that the project was only set out to provide training in three countries, but we managed to cover all six countries. And so that means that we were able to successfully pool uh, financial resources made available under the project to make a greater impact geographically. Using information to weather the impacts of climate change comes with many lessons. I, I want to raise two uh, lessons learned, particularly from this one. One of them is more or less reinforcing experiences from other projects, which is that in these projects, you have to have patience. In these projects, particularly when you're dealing with small island developing states with limited resources, and as I might say many times, uh, human resources that are divided in many different directions. Um, one person wearing multiple hats, but yet still everybody wants to have, you know, blood, sweat and tears in their, in their individual uh, spheres of interest. Patients become important. And you know, when you add COVID-19 on top of that and the delays that take place because of, of, of COVID-19, uh, it really tests your patience. You, 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 you really cannot uh, afford to, you know, drive uh, particularly the agencies in these, these small territories, most of them small territories, uh, sometimes to even deliver on time. You have to continue to work with them piece by piece. One of the lessons learned with respect to trying to build a country's capacity to develop and deliver climate information primarily through the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services that was reinforced through the regional track for the PPCR project, is that in the case of training workshops, you really see the advantages of having face-to-face -face trainings 
not just not because it's not possible to be done uh, remotely we have done that on several occasions post uh, those um, those training events under the PPCR but what is really coming out of uh, the the face to face trainings that cannot be done effectively online is the peer to peer learning between the different participants that sit side by side at the table to try to get through exercises, to try to understand, to grasp the information that is being thrown at them and to try to reformulate it into their realities. And I'm sure that this is not just the case in terms of training, but this is just a sphere in which I've been involved in, in the, in the project. Really and truly, the peer-to-peer -peer learning is the aspect that we lose by having to do everything online. And that costs us extra time as well in the building of capacity, especially when it comes to very technical elements, but also especially when it comes to decisions at a national scale of critical importance. Building on the work of the PPCR, how can Caribbean countries continue to strengthen climate information systems to build resilience? I want to add three things here. One, we have to continue to strengthen the national meteorological and hydrological services. That becomes very important. Uh, there are many moves uh, towards this uh, in various, uh, within various agencies. Uh, for example, in recent times, they have been, we've been working towards legislation for the national Met services in one uh, program. In another program, there was there there were strategic frameworks, uh, strategic plans being developed with the World Meteorological Organization in collaboration with the Caribbean Meteorological Organization headquarters unit and CIMH, and these will help to support the national uh, uh, roadmaps and plans of action that will be delivered on this project in a, in a couple of weeks. So these together, uh, if the powers that be pursue and follow the guidance of these documents, I'm sure that we will have a, a very well strengthened uh, uh, national meteorological services across the region that can deliver on their mandates and can deliver even beyond their mandates uh, to continue to support uh, decision making and planning uh, in our sectors when it comes to climate related information. The second one I will want to, to speak to to continue to build the climate capacity in the sector agencies so that it can to be able to talk, interpret, and apply climate and climate information in collaboration with the National Meteorological Services. And the, the, the last, the third and last one I would want to mention is that we continue to build the data that's needed for the, 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 the climate information products and services outside then uh, just in situ stations that we seek to have the capacity in the region that will be able to utilize remotely sensed data, for example. Uh, uh, that, 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 that's, that's key. Uh, that's going to be key going forward to some of some, some what we do. Uh, because, you know, stations can can be damaged, they can be lost after they're swept away by hurricanes, uh, hurricane floods, flood waters, for example. But also the, 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 the remotely sensed data that, we, that can be accessed, you know, it, it will more or less be there more often than not. And uh, it helps to, to, to bring a higher resolution uh, at times uh, to, to, to the data that we have. So incorporating this kind of data alongside the in-situ uh, data from our stations is something I think we need to push on with. More is happening, it's happening, but we need to, to continue to move forward with this where appropriate. I think if we are talking about how to proceed moving forward, uh, hinging on the aspect of capacity development of national meteorological and hydro hydrological services, I think it is critical to remind ourselves that one training event does not mean there's capacity build. 
two training events does not mean there's capacity built. Capacity building in terms of enabling the med services to deliver on their technical mandates is to make sure also that they feel comfortable with a new workload, with a new set of tools that they work with. And as anyone can tell us, the more we practice, the better and the more comfortable we feel about using a new set of tools or uh, applying a certain type of analysis. Because doing it once can be fun and can open your eyes, but I can assure you that for technical questions, if you don't feel the continued support of your peers and of a training network, uh, for instance, facilitated through the Caribbean uh, Regional Climate Center, then the new, the new supposedly built capacity ends up on a shelf. So that's where I, I want to reinforce the, the point that capacity development is a continuous process. It's not a one-time thing. And so if there's one thing that we can continue to build and we build into our programs, we keep building into our programs going forward, is to make sure that whatever new set of skills, new set of tools, new set of analyses that the med services can benefit from that we provide continuous train training for uh, so that indeed we build a critical mass within the med services, however small or large they may be, to continue the work and to really feel confident that what they produce is of a, is of a high standard and can be useful. Of course, to be useful, we need to make sure also that the priorities are aligned between the provision of the information and the need for the information. So the other aspect I wanted to highlight is that in building the capacity of the med services, it remains critical that they engage in, continue to engage in a dialogue with the users of the information so that we can make sure, for instance, through the national roadmaps and plans of action, uh, but also through other um, ways of interfacing that the work done by uh, the limited workforce in national uh, meteorological and hydrological services on the climate front, sometimes, as mentioned before, on their own time, that it serves the priorities of the country that they work for. I just wanted to add briefly to that because you actually took the words out of my mouth, Cedric, but um, to also build the capacity in the sectors themselves. Yes, it's good to build the capacity within the Met Service, but I also believe it's of extreme importance that the capacity is built in the sectors on how to use um, the technical products, how to interpret the technical products, um, you know, to be able to make informed decisions because at the end of the day if the med service is trained and they are fully equipped to produce high quality climate services and the sectors themselves are not able to use and interpret the information then you know it still goes so far so as you mentioned the dialogue is important, but also just building the capacity um, within the sectors themselves to be able to use and interpret climate information. The Carib Climate Podcast is produced by the Investment Plan for the Caribbean Regional Track of the Pilot Program for Climate Resilience, funded by the Inter-American Development Bank through the Climate Investment Funds and implemented by the Project Management Unit of the University of the West Indies Mona Office for Research and Innovation. The Carib Climate Podcast, using data to make climate resilience greater. Mm -hmm.